Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon from Brussels. I am Bruno Lete, a senior fellow with the German Marshall Fund, and I'm very pleased indeed to welcome our speakers and viewers on this uh, conversation, addressing the reforms process in Ukraine and the priorities towards the next Ukraine reform conference to be held 7 8 July in the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius. Um, just shortly, the Ukraine Reform Conference, a key annual moment uh, to discuss and evaluate the progress of Ukraine's reforms. Uh, the event was already created in 2017, and since then it has really become an important platform uh, to bring together Ukrainian and foreign government officials, EU, NATO, business, civil society leaders. So really a substantial effort uh, and key tool indeed for Ukraine and partners to uh, come together. So on this occasion, I also want to thank uh, our partners in this event, the Lithuanian permanent representation to the EU and the Ukraine mission to the EU. Your support has been uh, essential in bringing us together today. And also for GMF, this is a, a, a big priority. Uh, this conference. We, we, we have a long tradition working in Ukraine and on Ukraine-related issues. Uh, we do not only do policy programming, but we also do grant making through our Black Sea Trust uh, to actively support Ukrainian civil society. And of course, uh, we also hold our annual Odessa debate, uh, our flagship conference in Ukraine uh, every year. The next debate uh, will be in October. So, this is a short intro from my side for today's discussion, but now it's time to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for today, uh, Ukraine's Prime Minister, Denis Shmial. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you very much for taking uh, some time in your busy schedule for joining us today. Uh, since you became Prime Minister uh, last year, you have worked hard uh, to push your country uh, forward on the reforms track and in very challenging circumstances, not only fighting a pandemic, uh, but also fighting a, a real war on your eastern border. So very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, for our audience, there is a simultaneous translation on the Zoom channel. Just click the little button on the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred language. Uh, and after the Prime Minister's remark, we will then have a more in-depth conversation with our panelists. But for now, Prime Minister, the floor is all yours. Дякую. Ще раз вітаю всіх. Шановний пане міністр закордонних справ Литви, шановна пані віце-прем'єр-міністр з питань європейської і атлантичної інтеграції пані Стефанішина, шановна пані керівниця групи підтримки України в Європейській комісії, шановна пані голова антикорупційної ініціативи ЄС в Україні, шановні посли, шановні учасники сьогоднішньої зустрічі, міжнародні партнери, шановні друзі, колеги, Щиро вдячний за нагоду взяти участь сьогодні в цій події, яка має важливе значення в контексті підготовки до конференції реформ України, запланованої на 7-8 липня цього року в місті Вільнюс. Особливо приємно зустрітись з вами, нашими європейськими партнерами та друзями, подякувати за зусилля в організації конференції та окреслити у своєму вступному слові напрями та пріоритети реформаторських зусиль уряду України. Україна пережила колосальну трансформацію з тих пір, як ми отримали незалежність. Наша держава вийшла з планової економіки з невизначеними і нерозвиненими демократичними інституціями, щоб стати амбітною європейською країною. Наш вибір виборювався революцією гідності, його продовжують виборювати українці і сьогодні протидіючи агресії Росії. Окрім зовнішнього, ми маємо наш внутрішній фронт, велику роботу щодо забезпечення незворотності євроінтеграційного та євроатлантичного вибору України. На сьогодні ця робота ускладнюється викликами, зумовленими пандемією COVID-19. Саме тому уряд України підійшов системно до підготовки ключових програмних документів країни. Перед усім це стосується програми діяльності уряду та плану пріоритетних дій уряду. Також нещодавно уряд прийняв національну економічну стратегію до 2030 року до якої долучилися понад 500 учасників, представники більше як 20 аналітичних центрів, понад 30 бізнес-асоціацій, 40 органів виконавчої влади, експертне середовище, громадянське суспільство, народні депутати, місцеве самоврядування. Тобто це насправді стратегічний документ країни, над яким працювало велике коло, коло експертів, спеціалістів і представників громадянського суспільства. 
Стратегія визначає довгострокову економічну візію, вектори та червоні лінії економічного розвитку. Цей стратегічний документ має на меті сформувати конкурентно-спроможні умови для бізнесу і інвестицій, відновити довіру до держави, у тому числі на міжнародному ринку, стимулювати розвиток інновацій і модернізацію секторів економіки, забезпечити розвиток людського потенціалу і виграти конкуренцію за таланти. Забезпечити також рівні права, можливості жінок і чоловіків у всіх сферах нашого суспільства. Стратегія визначає конкретні кроки для розвитку промисловості, агросектору, видобутку корисних копалень, інфраструктури, транспорту, енергетичного сектору, інформаційно-комунікаційних технологій, креативних індустрій та сфери послуг. Також стратегія враховує важливі наскрізні напрямки, які сьогодні є визначальними, для європейської політики – діджиталізацію, зелений курс, розвиток підприємництва, збалансований регіональний розвиток. Вже сьогодні Україна успішно стабілізувала свою макрофінансову ситуацію і банківську систему, не дивлячись на кризу. Для підтримки бізнесу і стимулювання інвестицій було запроваджено новий інструмент гарантії портфельних позик. Відкриття ринку землі – та масштабна приватизація стануть каталізаторами зростання і будуть залучати іноземний капітал. Стосовно відкриття ринку землі, буквально цього тижня було прийнято два законопроекти, які стосуються відкриття вже повноцінного ринку, і ми переконані, що з 1 липня в Україні буде повноцінний, відкритий, справжній земельний ринок, чого, за що ми боролись, чого очікували 30 років нашої незалежності. Щоб надати людям та бізнесу доступ до якісних та зручних державних послуг, без будь-яких корупційних ризиків оцифрувати послуги, уряд запровадив єдину точку входу для надання державних електронних послуг – це портал і мобільний додаток «Дія». Уряд має дорожню карту інтеграції України до єдиного цифрового ринку ЄС, що дає змогу Україні вже сьогодні працювати над цією інтеграцією, та вже зараз ми можемо ділитися з колегами нашим досвідом у цій сфері. Продовжуємо впровадження реформ з децентралізації. Уряд затвердив перспективні плани формування територій громад в 24 областях. Сформовані 136 нових районів, які відповідають стандартам територіального поділу Європейського Союзу. Український ринок газу повністю перейшов на щоденне балансування. Створено умови транспортування газу для споживачів України та ЄС з 1 січня 2020 року. Україна повністю поділяє і підтримує кліматичні амбіції ЄС і готує прагматично прораховані, але все ж амбітні пропозиції щодо другого національно визначеного внеску. Уряд налаштований і постійно намагається врахувати зелений курс ЄС у своїй політиці, тому що розробити власний зелений порядок денний відповідно до зеленого курсу ЄС нами спільно з ЄС започатковано окремий діалог з виконавчим віце-президентом Єврокомісії паном Тіммермансом. Україна представила стороні ЄС свої пропозиції щодо співпраці, і ми спільно визначили три топ-пріоритети – енергоефективність, водень і трансформація вугільних регіонів. У лютому цього року під час цього засідання Ради Асоціації України ЄС ми домовились про подальшу співпрацю з ЄС і кроки насамперед щодо інтеграції до внутрішнього ринку ЄС та поглиблення галузевої інтеграції. Приємно відзначити, що напередодні самої Ради Асоціації ЄС привітав зусилля уряду, спрямовані на реформування. І це було також зазначено у звіті Європарламенту про імплементацію угоди про асоціацію з Україною. На сьогодні сторони розпочали внутрішню оцінку досягнення цілої угоди про асоціацію, як це передбачено в статті 481, з метою представлення її результатів на 23-му саміті України ЄС. Крім цього, у цьому ж зв'язку проводиться робота щодо подальшого перегляду лібералізації торгівлі товарами у рамках поглибленої та всеохоплюючої зони вільної торгівлі з ЄС. Уряд ставить перед собою конкретні цілі щодо використання усього потенціалу угоду про асоціацію, Комісія з координації імплементації угоди про асоціацію результат роботи, якої доводять ефективність її як платформи, як спільної платформи. Платформа об'єднує уряд, парламент і президентську гілку влади. 
інтенсивно тривав і триває як на рівні уряду, органів державної влади, так і на рівні експертів політичний діалог з НАТО. Одним із результатів такого активного та багатостороннього залучення стало врахування партнерами НАТО пріоритетів взаємодії та безпекових занепокоєнь України в аналітичному процесі з розроблення концепції реформування НАТО та його майбутнього розвитку до 2030 року. Стратегічно важливе значення для безпеки та стабільності всього євроатлантичного простору має Чорноморський регіон. Ми прагнемо посилити взаємодію НАТО для вирішення нових викликів в безпеці в Чорноморському регіоні і закликаємо союзників пріоритизувати Чорноморі у своїй стратегії. Ми готові до співпраці для посилення можливостей військово-морських сил України, покращення ситуаційної обізнаності в регіоні, готові максимізувати обмін інформацією та посилити свої спроможності у кіберзахисті. У 2020 році ми отримали статус країни-партнера НАТО з розширеними можливостями. Розпочато консультації Альянсу та України для узгодження подальших спільних кроків. Триває поступове переведення сектору безпеки та оборони України, Збройних сил України на стандарти НАТО. Цілеспрямований та планомірний перехід сектору безпеки та оборони і Збройних сил на стандарти НАТО є одним з першочергових пріоритетів нашого уряду. Підсумовуючи, хочу сказати, що зроблено багато, але ще більше треба зробити, безумовно. Уряд України націлений на нарощування темпів євроінтеграційних та євроатлантичних реформ. Це можливо лише з подальшою підтримкою наших надійних міжнародних партнерів. Переконаний, що конференція реформ в липні цього року у Вільнюсі, а також заходи заплановані у рамках підготовки до цієї конференції, сприятимуть кращому розумінню реформ в Україні, ширшій залученості міжнародних партнерів, сприятимуть пріоритизації допомоги, яка надаватиметься Україні в майбутньому. Бажаю усім учасникам сьогоднішньої зустрічі плідної роботи, плідної дискусії. Дякую вам всім за увагу, бажаю міцного здоров'я. Дякую. Thank you, Prime Minister. Дякую. Uh, I know you have to leave us now, but uh, your ideas will certainly serve uh, as a source of inspiration for, for our discussion today. So thank you very much for having been with us. Um, without much further ado, uh, let me turn to our discussions for today, and uh, I would like to briefly introduce everyone to you. Uh, Gabrielius Landsbergis, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, welcome. Uh, Olga Stefanishinia, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Katarina Maternova, Deputy Director General at DGNIR, but also the acting head of the uh, support group for Ukraine at the European Commission. Welcome to you as well. And last but not least, um, Eka Tkeshelashvili, Head of Programs at the uh, European Anti-Corruption Initiative to Ukraine. So a truly uh, star panel for the discussion today. Uh, we are on the record, but that should not prevent us from having an interactive and engaging discussion. First, I'll give the floor to our panelists, uh, but after these initial remarks, I look forward to engage with the audience as well. So please feel free to use the chat function in Zoom and post your comments uh, or questions. As your humble moderator, I'll do my best uh, to integrate these in our discussion. So uh, now that the house rules are clear, uh, let me turn to you, Minister Landsbergis. Uh, as the host nation of the 2021 Ukraine Reform Conference, What priorities uh, Lithuania, Lithuania sees during the URC and what do you think should be achieved during the event? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for this uh, opportunity to, uh, to discuss uh, upcoming conference. Uh, first of all, I'm very pleased uh, to, uh, to see uh, dear Prime Minister. Uh, indeed, it's a, it's a great, uh, great pleasure to, to Uh, to see you um, and dear colleagues, um, just let me briefly introduce uh, the main uh, the main ideas for for the upcoming uh, uh, conference. Uh, speaking about the main priorities for for the uh, Ukraine Reform Conference, we aim to bring together Ukraine and its partners to discuss achievements, consolidate support for reforms, and strengthen that strengthens the country's resilience and realize the ambitious and reform-oriented Ukraine 2030 strategy. 
ensure continuation, sustainability, and consistency of the reform process. This year, our main message of the conference is strong Ukraine in a stronger European and Euro-Atlantic family. Uh, the Ukrainian Reform uh, Conference in Vilnius will provide a platform for all Ukrainian state stakeholders to discuss reform vision, objectives, strategies, and further cooperation, give advice and expectations, criticize, not, uh, not too much, I guess, uh, and express reservations when needed. It's also worth underlining that the Ukraine Reform Conference is not just one physical event. It's an ongoing process continuing from one conference to another, therefore keeping constant attention on Ukraine's reform process as a whole. Despite ongoing Russia's aggression and the pandemic, Ukraine has continued to make progress, advancing in key reforms, banking, land reforms, decentralization, making progress in the digital sector, achieving success in implementation of the agricultural and rural development policies. Yet, as the Constitutional Court's action in late 2020 have shown, it is crucial that Ukraine continue these efforts in order to make reforms irreversible, especially in terms of judicial reform, rule of law, and fight against corruption. In the reform vision presented at the last Ukraine Reform Conference in Toronto, the well-being of citizens was put at the heart of reform process. We expect presentation from the Ukrainian leadership of the results achieved in the reform process, as well as some feasible reform targets to be discussed and agreed during the conference with a view to take stock on progress at Ukrainian Reform Conference in 2022 in Switzerland. Reforms are not implemented for the sake of reforms. We need them for stability, prosperity of the people, for countries' internal and external resilience, for attracting foreign investment. Ukraine also needs them on the road to Euro European and Euro-Atlantic integration that we constantly support as a country, as we learn from our own experience on the road to European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Clear signals from the European and Euro-Atlantic community on Ukraine's aspiration are needed to consolidate reform efforts and serve as a great incentive to move forward. While encouraging Ukraine to fully use the potential of the Association Agreement and DCFTA, we also cannot shy away from our own commitments enshrined in the agreement, deepening sectoral cooperation and moving towards gradual integration of Ukraine in the EU's internal market. Speaking of NATO, our leaders in Bucharest in 2008 agreed that Ukraine will eventually become a member of NATO. Today, we need to ensure Ukraine that it has a viable path towards NATO membership to encourage it to continue implementation of the necessary reforms and prepare for eventual membership. Thank you, dear colleagues, for this opportunity, and I hope for a very fruitful discussion today. Well, thank thank you very much, uh, Minister. And um, you know, I think that uh, you are setting the tone right for uh, elaborating a bit more on some of the ideas that you just mentioned. Um, and the next speaker that uh, we would like to feature is uh, the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, that is also with us today. Thank you very much uh, again for joining. Uh, so I'd like perhaps to ask you a bit of the same question um, about the upcoming URC. What, what are Ukraine's goals and uh, the priorities uh, in, in Vilnius? Thank you, Bruna. Thank you, uh, uh, our uh, beloved Prime Minister, uh, Denis Schmigal and Gabrielis uh, uh, and all the participants. First of all, um, uh, I'm absolutely pleased to hear today that we're mostly on the same page in a, uh, the vision of development of our country. And Vilnius, Vilnius has always been the capital, which is the closest to our heart, the capital where the historical decisions are being taken or not taken some time and hopefully will be taken in the years to come. The platform for the Vilnius Reform Conference this year would be the, first, uh, first, the perfect one to step up uh, uh, our goals and to boost the dialogue internally in our country. First of all, I would not add um, a lot to what have already been comprehensively outlined by Prime Minister, but what I want to mark is that EU-Ukraine relations have shifted to the next level of comprehensive and significantly deeper dialogue at all areas. We feel it both 
politically and economically. It is demonstrated also by the results of the latest EU-Ukraine summit in October 22 and also the Association Council meeting which has taken place in 2021. It's just today that I came back from Brussels with the clear understanding that the, this year will definitely be marked by intensive engagement and political level uh, with all the highest representative of our country. Ukraine is a frank and open uh, with its European ambitions and aspirations. Full EU and NATO membership is a strategic goal of Ukraine, not only inspired by the willingness of Ukrainian citizens, but also uh, uh, put into the constitution of our country. We are totally committed to continue effective movement towards reforms agenda and the government of Ukraine in cooperation with parliament under the leadership of the president of Ukraine continues to take necessary measures to build on the progress and already implement new reforms and ensure implementation of those structural amendments and developments which have been undertaken by our country since 2014 but mostly over the, the last two years. Uh, we aim to the progressive political association and economic integration with the European Union. While political association now in a time of the uh, of the geopolitical shifts and renew role of European Union and NATO are very much needed. So it, it is put in as a priority for our side. Ambitious goals for access to EU market, as Gabriel has have already mentioned, are the heart of our economic transformation because it's not only the uh, political ambition, it's the way how fair competitive economy could be built on our, uh, on our land. We're looking, first of all, forward for signing the long-awaited common aviation area agreement between Ukraine and European Union already for the first half of the 2021 to make sure that the free movement of people following the recent um, liberalization of the, um, of the traveling would be, uh, uh, would be completed with the freedom of aviation between our countries. The European Green Deal is our new and very perspective area for close cooperation. Ukraine is ready to contribute to European green transformation as the, uh, uh, as the part of the European fa family of European democracies. We are planning to base our cooperation on a joint roadmap uh, and a joint financial, economic and political priorities related to decarbonization and green transformation. Ukraine is also keen to enhance cooperation uh, bilaterally and multilaterally in the digital area aimed to integration into EU digital single market and also of course Ukraine have uh, always paid a strong attention to our nation as a nation uh, where energy security is the security of the whole Europe does the discussion on the integration of uh, Ukraine into EU energy market and establishing the rules of play based on the legislation which is already aligned with the EU ones is the strategic goal we, we put in terms of European integration, but also believe that uh, integration of these markets would definitely be the one bringing us back to our family. Of course, we uh, call to, uh, to a strong position on the Nord Stream 2, which has purely a political nature and the project is there. We are, of course, following the recent developments in this regard and uh, believe that this is another attempt to undermine the international unity and, uh, and the partnership between, uh, between many of the countries, including Ukraine. Uh, many of the key reforms have already been outlined by Prime Minister, but also I also would like to mention that at the beginning of February 2021, the members of the Parliament supported uh, the Parliament's working plan, which includes almost 40 bills uh, on Ukraine's integration with the EU and NATO. And it's only the last years when we were really launched the structural reforms related to security and defense sector, which has not been in place for 30 years of independence. So the whole sector was based basically on the, on the post-Soviet era of intelligence, security service, defense procurement, civilian control, and etc. This is something which is now being implemented by the government and supported by the parliament. Uh, the implementation of the fundamental anti-corruption legislation and legislation related to the reform of the judiciary and establishment of the 
comprehensive understanding and, and clarity when it comes to the rule of law, which is the basic principle of the, any democratic development is, is crucial for us. Only this week, the parliament has supported the bill which would pave the way to reestablishment of the key judicial institution, the High Council of Justice, who will be in charge of the integrity of the judiciary, which has been a very clear sign from our side that our political dedication is transformed in the concrete steps presented by our government. A lot of issues were covered by the corporate government governance reform. It will be re-enhanced and preserved by the uh, upcoming pieces of legislation to be adopted by the parliament, but uh, to ensure that the transparency and the reduce of the government's share in the economy um, progressed further also with the process of privatization in our country. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've also been uh, extremely uh, successful this year in paving the way towards completion of the reform of, of decentralization, which was completely uh, completely finished in 2022 with the aim to form the efficient local cell government capable of creating and maintaining adequate living conditions for individuals, people and hromadas uh, in our big country. A series of laws and programs were adopted to protect the environment adapt the, uh, the, and prevent adverse impact to climate change. Ukraine has committed itself to be the part of the Climate Ambitious Countries Club, and we remain committed to this goal and keep on delivering our policies in that spirit. We have a number of expectations which are uh, uh, lying beyond our borders, and these are the expectations from the democratic world and communities. We, uh, our reforms efforts and the international community could support Ukraine transition by granting the country the NATO membership action plan. This is the long-awaited clarity which Ukraine is waiting for 13 years after the Bucharest summit, and we are really happy to to hear that the discourse largely now supported and uh, and launched basically after this long period already between many of the allies and we're grateful for Lithuania to being a, a strong advocate for this necessity uh, in the world. Uh, but meanwhile, while political discussions are taking place, we ha have stepped in significantly with the uh, EOP status, which was granted to Ukraine just a year ago as a recognition of the contribution of our country to the collective security in the transatlantic area. We have paved the way to, towards the roadmap, which was uh, presented by our side. And just this week, we've already started the practical cancel consultations on a specific issues which could be utilized by our country together with allies to make sure that the interoperability uh, and uh, greater Euro Atlantic integration is taking place. Of course, we are looking forward to get engaged not only into, uh, into contribution, to the development of policies both in EU and NATO arena, but we also want to participate in development of the new strategic goals and paving the way towards the new neighborhood policies and addressing the aspirations of those countries aspiring for greater integration with the EU and NATO. And we're looking forward for the possibility to propose our suggestions to the upcoming conference for the future of Europe, which was officially launched in, on the 9th of May this year. Uh, uh, the discussion which will be taken uh, on the Vilnius conference reform would be very useful and timely ahead of, of the upcoming EU-Ukraine summit, but also Eastern Partnership Summit, which is now being largely discussed and uh, subject to the interest from our side. And uh, uh, last but not least from our side, uh, and it's really important that recent escalation of Donbas, on Donbas and uh, build up of Russian forces in the territory of, of, of Donbas, the Donetsk and Lugansk regions, but also Crimea and the immediate a coordinated and united reaction of international community has proven that Ukraine and the whole world has the resilience over aggressive and hybrid uh, 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 a hybrid way the Russia implements its martial plan against democracies. We call on these nations, and this would be our call over the conference, to build resilience over these hybrid threats and disinformation, and to make sure that Russia is wholly accountable to its aggressive measures and aggressive uh, behavior 
on the territory of Ukraine. Thank you so much. Looking forward for the other inter inter interventions and thank you for the warm inputs from your side also. Well, and, and thank you for uh, articulating a clear vision uh, on your thoughts. Uh, you always make it sound obvious, but uh, there's no doubt that you are leading a huge effort uh, to keep uh, Ukraine on, on the right track. So thank you for your, for your remarks. Um, our next speaker is Katerina Maternova, uh, who uh, represents the European Commission. Welcome to you this afternoon. Um, a very simple question, I would say. How, how does the EU perceive uh, the reform process in Ukraine? Um, are expectations being met? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. That's a, that's a big question. So let me a uh, little bit step back and, and say the following. Uh, societal transformation, economic transformation is a, is a big task. It calls for firing on all cylinders. And on top of everything, going through a transition and going through these transformation reforms is like uh, bicycling up a hill. You cannot stop halfway because you don't stay at the halfway. You roll back. So it's a, it's a constant effort of a constant uh, uh, keeping at it. And uh, basically what's happening in Ukraine is, is a little bit com more complicated than many other transitions countries uh, had it before for, for a number of reasons. First of all, is the basic transition reforms, which are difficult. Minister uh, Landsberg has talked about the need for competition. You need to have business-friendly regulation. You need to have a functioning economy. You need to have an uh, economy that is not captured by special interest and, and that is free of corruption. So that's a, that's a big chunk. Then comes the second chunk, which is stabilizing the governance. You know, there is a lot of talk about judicial reform and anti-corruption. All of those are very, very valid. But at the same time, the state needs to build a new modern uh, public service. And all of that, this whole area of governance in, is another big, huge bucket. And what's happening now is that we are now adding to it something that our countries didn't have in uh, the, the, the new so-called new member states, the ones that and entered uh, the EU in 2004 or 2007, uh, which is the whole green transformation and digital uh, transition. These are different times. This is a time when the European Union itself is going through a big, these dual big transitions. And in addition to what already Ukraine has to do, we are adding this to the list. And that's really a huge task. And all of this against the backdrop of a war in Donbass, of Ukraine government not controlling all of its territory and being subjected on a daily basis uh, to the hybrid threats, disinformation that really shape not only the domestic discourse or thwart in a way the domestic discourse, but also shape in a negative way views of the international community on what's happening in Ukraine. Because a lot of the Russian narratives are very sort of easy to swallow and they shape the, the attitude. So if you consider all of this, I think that uh, it's in fact quite remarkable that in the middle of a constitutional crisis where the constitutional court struck down important reforms, there is a lot of uh, debates on corporate governance. There is uh, uh, lots of you know, push from us, from the IMF, from the World Bank, from a number of places. Suddenly, two critical laws on land reform passed. And the second one with a huge majority in the Rada. So you have this, you know, it's amazing that how much one does get. And, and I didn't even mention the pandemic. All of this happening in a in the middle of the largest pandemic in the in the last hundred years. So uh, I certainly think that uh, Ukraine cannot stop. There is a lot to still be done, but I think they are very, very much moving in the right direction. 
what uh, what the EU has done is, well, first of all, we unwaveringly stand behind Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. That's sort of a not even for this pa panel, but I, I don't want to not say that because that's an important uh, parameter of our support. But what the EU has done over the last few years is that it has established uh, the support group for Ukraine, which I uh, have the pleasure of leading, which is really a one of a kind. It's the only country outside of the EU that has a special task force and with colleagues dedicated to work full time on policy reforms, uh, really important transformations that, that are necessary. That's one. And we also couple it with financial resources not in the classic what the what used to be done you know uh, individual projects but really uh, invest uh, in a premeditated way and big chunks to enable large transformations both the prime minister and olga uh, mentioned some of them whether it's decentralization whether it's public administration reform energy efficiency reform public finance management so judicial reform anti corruption efforts sort of these big fundamental blocks of uh, creating a modern, prosperous, stable Ukraine. I think all of them we have been either driving or very closely uh, associated with. And uh, the tools that we use is, uh, as I mentioned, money, that's, that's one. But the, the second one is, of course, we also have uh, macrofinancial assistance and some of our programs that set out benchmarks and conditions that are the push factor. Um, but on the on the pull factor, on the other hand, and I think this was mentioned also again by by Minister Landsberg is uh, that what we are now working on is a much deeper sectoral integration into the European economy. I mean, the, the way I would describe it is to really use the full potential of the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade area, which is the trade agreement uh, between Ukraine and, and, and the EU, to, to allow in selected sectors this, this very coveted uh, um, internal market treatment. I mean, this is all a process, but uh, I just discussed with Olga yesterday um, when she was still in Brussels, uh, that over the last uh, number of months, we have come a, a long way in this area. And we, we are determined to continue. And I will finish on an example uh, of that. Uh, uh, the reason Olga was in Brussels is because we held the, we co-chaired the first uh, of the Green Deal dialogues uh, between uh, Ukraine and us. And I uh, very much see it as a very, uh, very successful event where we take all the different uh, all the different elements that are under this big green deal umbrella and bring it into one, one stream to, so it actually gets sufficient political attention, both on the side of Ukraine, as well as on the side of the, the European Commission. Because I think this is going to not be easy. This is gonna be a painful transformation and and we need to undergo it uh, at the same time but we also need to support ukraine and understand that in addition to the green and digital transformations they have all the other ones to go through and in the middle um, of uh, of uh, of an armed conflict in the east so the situation is uncomparably harder than uh, than uh, uh, some of us had it uh, before and let alone the, the geopolitical state of the world as it is, is also more complicated. So all I can say is uh, uh, good luck. We are with you. We will continue supporting. And, and, and I really hope we will have a very, very good uh, meeting in Vilnius. I've been to every single of the four conferences. This is the, the being the fourth that, uh, I think they become an institution and an important moment to uh, take stock and, and not only do the shorthand of what's Ukraine doing, but also delve into some of the, uh, some of the uh, more, more important issues that they're dealing with. Thank you. Well, and thank you for sharing your straightforward uh, 
thoughts. Um, I, I did detect a touch of optimism, I think. Uh, you said there's still a lot of work to most do. Most definitely, most definitely. It was meant to be optimistic. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, moving forward despite complex uh, circumstances. Um, now, thank you for this message. In the meantime, um, I also want to welcome um, the Deputy Foreign Minister of uh, Lithuania, Mantas Adomenas. Uh, welcome to you. The Foreign Minister unfortunately had to leave, but uh, we're very pleased indeed that uh, you took the time to join us. So thank you for being with us. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. We'll get back to you. <laughs> um, Eka, uh, Czechoslav Vili, you had to wait a long time uh, patiently, but uh, you know, being the last on the panel usually also gives opportunities to react to what was said. Um, so, by all means, uh, you know, I, I think my question to you was was, was the following: Is you you know you 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 look into a very specific domain, of course, uh, through the lens of your organization. So, what what is your assessment uh, on the fight against corruption in in Ukraine? Well, th thank you, Bruno. And it's been a pleasure to listen to all the speakers. So I was not only patient, but I was excited to listen. So it's a pleasure to be this part of this conversation. Um, we frequently hear this question, is, is Ukraine winning the war against Ukraine or is, is a fight against Ukraine? And I always like to highlight that Ukraine is not fighting corruption. It is waging war against corruption. And there is a huge difference. Uh, there are many battles that one has to win before winning the war of this magnitude and scale. It is not the war that can be won in just single battlefield, so to say if we speak in military terms in this regard. And if we compare, uh, the, 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 if we take the stock of the developments in this regard and see the dynamics, Ukraine has been uh, remarkably successful in winning many battles, but there are obviously battles left that has to have to be won for the overall victory to be achieved. And I think for our listeners today and viewers in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine, it is important to understand that in Ukraine, fight against corruption, war against corruption, means dismantling the system not the deviation from what otherwise is a system. And that means that complexity of actions that have to be undertaken is really huge. It requires comprehensive approach, holistic approach as we like to call it, and extreme dedication and commitment. First of all, from our Ukrainian friends and colleagues, but patience and commitment from us as well, those who are helping Ukraine in that difficult process. And if one compares to, to what I have to say to what already Katerina mentioned, indeed, it's, it's work in different dimensions and directions at the same time, concurrently tackling issues related to prevention of corruption and at the same time issues relating to impunity for corruption. And that means that successes that Ukraine had to achieve had to be achieved in all of these directions, tackling impunity as one of the pillars of the systemic corruption, seeing through how the legislative framework, which is conducive to corrupt practices, had to be changed in the way that it would become conducive to economic growth, uh, freedoms on an individual basis, level play field for everybody in the country and attractiveness of country in terms of investment climate and with that economic development and creation of the jobs, obviously. Um, institutional weaknesses and uh, basically corroded public institutions had to be changed, dismantled at the same time while creating the new practices, new cultures, new institutions. In other words, dealing with, with destructive element of, uh, of what had to be done while creating the new systems. And uh, I think a part of my message in this regard is importance to understand that reforms which are successful in the anti-corruption field, they destruct at the same time while they create something new. That makes it painful and difficult as a process and as a process that requires further actions for sustaining results. So some of the results that I will be very pleased to mention already as, as indicative of what are the big wins that have been already achieved, they all have that element of the need of sustainability. Achievements when they are tangible, 
they generate counterattack from the vested interest, which means that while we see the developments which take place, we need to be ready for sustaining them, supporting our friends in Ukraine even more for them to be able to consolidate results and with that to pave a way for more uh, progress and uh, more achievements in this direction. I'll start with the, with the, with the criminal justice system where Ukraine has been uh, successful in creating a complete chain of specialized anti-corruption bodies, investigative like NABU, Specialized Prosecutor's Office, SAPO, and then High Anti-Corruption Court. High Anti-Corruption Court is the newest in this chain of institutions. It's a little more than one and a half that it's functioning, but we already see that the completion of this chain already starts to develop tangible results. We see that uh, an amazing work of investigative body like NABU and Special Prosecutor's Office is not in vain anymore because there is a court that hears those cases, is efficient in dealing with the caseload and starts to deliver the first judgments. And that what breaks then an expectation that impunity is more of a rule rather than accountability for corruption. And that will have a game-changing impact over the time, I'm sure, in Ukraine for the development of the whole system. But here again, coming back to the point on sustainability that I mentioned, now we are at the moment when sustaining independence of these bodies and their effective action is extremely important because again, they started to deliver, which generates counterattack from those who don't want them to be successful, which means that their independence and effectiveness is key to be sustained. Here, I would say that there are two markers uh, that uh, one needs to pay attention how the developments uh, will take place. It is uh, the selection of the new head of SAPO that is ongoing right now. The independent and professional new head of this very important institution will be pivotal for how the anti-corruption framework in its entirety will function in, in Ukraine. And then uh, adoption of the amendments to the, to the law on NABU. Katerina already mentioned uh, decisions of the Constitutional Court. One of the victims of those decisions was the law on NABU and then uh, sustainability of action of this institution in the long run. And now the government and then Ukrainian parliament together with international partners are working together to ensure that there is legislative framework guaranteeing an interrupted action of NABU. And then in due course, there will be a uh, time coming for NABU as well when the leadership will be changed. And there again, independent and professional leadership of this institution will be key for the whole system to to act in an independent and professional way. Uh, digitalization, key in anti-corruption area as well. Uh, I come from an experience of Georgia where digitalization played a pivotal role again for sustaining a leap forward than one could do in anti-corruption field. And Ukraine is doing quite a lot in this direction. What we help with the uh, our action is that for the first time in Ukraine, for example, law enforcement system, and here the anti-corruption bodies will be front runners, will have, for example, the fully digitalized uh, e-case management system, as we call it, transparent, efficient, revolutionizing the way how law enforcement and pretrial stage of court deliberations will be taking place. And we hope that that will be uh, upscaled then for the whole of the law enforcement in the future. Certainly, we will be uh, more than willing to share experience and, and, and resources on that. The president has been a staunch supporter of this process of digitalization, a special law has been, legal amendments have been initiated by the president's office to enable the transformation and hopefully we'll have this uh, legislation soon already finally adopted with the second reading. Part of the developments that could be good to point out are, are very relevant to economic development of Ukraine, apart from anti-corruption element of that. Uh, many of you might know already about Prozoro systems when it comes to procurement. But there is another side of the Prozoro, which is Prozoro sales, that we've been very fortunate to assist in terms of development that deals with leasing of the state property, privatization of the state property, great developments that are taking place now with the sales in the areas which are sectoral, like timber, preparation for uh, sales through the blockchain auctioning system of energy products as well, in the future related to concessions as well. In overall, when it comes to the scale of change that it develops, it's immense in not only statistics, but the way how the system works. Here now in Ukraine, where many might think that, oh, you know, system is uh, corrupt, what you can do when it comes to privatization and then leasing of the state property and in different sectoral areas, it's, it's, it's a system 
that is so modern that many countries in European Union don't have it when it comes to the blockchain auctioning system, as transparent as independent as it could be. And uh, the figures are stellar already. I mean, it's uh, for le in the leasing direction, it's already 94% more income that state receives through the auctioning system rather than ever, including local governments. It's 100, 110% more in the privatization sector. So in this regard, when it comes to digital tools, technological development, and to be honest, spotting local creative ideas and supporting them as it was with Brazoro timely and efficiently is what delivers the results. And I'm sure that there is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, some of that experience that could be uh, very interesting for many around the globe to see and share when it comes to how procurement and how leasing and then uh, sales uh, of uh, the state uh, properties could be insured in a transparent way. Uh, I would say a few words uh, with um, ability to troubleshoot uh, reforms that are malfunctioning. That is very important as well. We've had an experience, for example, in Ukraine with the uh, Corruption Prevention Agency, which was a great initiative to, for establishment in Ukraine. We, in abbreviation, it's called NACP. Uh, hugely important mandate, e-declarations, party financing, prevention of corruption. Kickoff was very troublesome as it uh, proved at the time. And uh, I believe that what makes it important with collaboration with international partners was that the problem was spotted time. Uh, European Union was one of the strongest uh, actors in its action to push for reboot of this agency. When the new government came in after elections in 2019, the changes to the law took place. Uh, support was provided from international partners for rebooting this very important agency. And we see that the results are already palpable with the way how this agency acts, how it is open for change, and then how it starts to deliver. I don't want to have an extremely rosy picture, perhaps in that sense, even though, though I always wish to have that for Ukraine. Uh, some, some challenges that are needs to be identified are cross-cutting, I would say. And then I would only mention here judicial reform. I'm a lawyer by education. I, 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 that might be my bias, but I firmly believe that for all of the reforms that we have talked about and then for the achievements to be sustainable, uh, rule of law is essential and rule of law cannot be attained and cannot be respected as a principle and reality if there is no trusted, independent and credible judicial system. And this is the biggest uh, item now on the reforms agenda, I would believe, for Ukraine. There is movement forward a lot of uh, coordinated work, uh, but uh, obviously we are all awaiting for the successful completion of that very important direction of the reforms. And very final words on, on, on EU. Uh, Katarina mentioned about support group for, for Ukraine, how much unique it is. And I here I want to say this as a Georgian, Georgian who was engaged in quite a lot of reforms in my own country. I only wish that we would have had at the time anything similar and resembling to that strategically devised a platform for coordination and strategic approach to the assistance. It's a remarkable institution. It allows for strategic and comprehensive approach for all the technical assistance programs in the country and not only from the side of the EU. And I will end with that. This is uh, extremely important to have coordinated approach and vision with other partners of Ukraine as well. And here a close partnership with our friends and colleagues from the US government, from the British government, and then from other donors and partners of Ukraine has been extremely important for consolidating our effort in such a way that more help, more assistance is delivered to Ukraine. And ultimately we're more efficient and effective in helping Ukraine to, to at to attain its own strategic objective of becoming prosperous, democratic, uh, and uh, integrated um, country into the European Union and NATO. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Eka. Um, I heard the big wins, but uh, I also heard uh, you underlining that now we need to sustain uh, those wins uh, and troubleshoot. Uh, the reforms if, if, if needed. I like that word. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing uh, your expertise. Um, I will open up the floor for, for Q&A uh, with the audience. So by all means, feel free to uh, send your questions uh, through the Q&A feed. Uh, but before I turn to the audience, I just wanted to see with our panelists, if anyone wants to give a reaction to what was said, if there's a pressing feeling about something, or perhaps 
uh, you, Deputy Minister Adomenas, uh, would also like to jump in on some of the things that, that you heard. So. Thank you. I'm, I'll wait for, for questions. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, the essence of what needed to be said was said by my minister. So I don't want to add or detract unnecessarily. Okay, good. Well, actually, uh, the questions are already coming in. So I'll just uh, fire on to the panel, if you don't mind. Uh, we have a first question here, actually, from across the Atlantic, from Washington, D.C., uh, Jeremy Barenberg is asking, I, I personally think it's a pretty important question, but um, the question is, what do you think can be done to ensure that foreign investors uh, continue to feel confident in their investments uh, in Ukraine, given uh, some of the related challenges? So I, I would be very curious to hear what the panel has to say on that. Um, so anyone wants to volunteer? <laughs> Eka. One sentence. One sentence answer. One, one sentence answer is to uh, continue with uh, judicial reform, and not only judicial reform, but also private enforcement of contracts. And uh, both of these issues are part of our uh, macrofinancial assistance conditions. So that's one. And the other one is uh, is uh, transparent. Uh, well-run transparent privatization of some of the key assets. Okay, uh, Eka, sure. What I, what I could only add to what has been mentioned is uh, looking through and streamlining uh, the, the laws and regulations pertaining to taxation and customs as well, but then more taxation, so that when it comes to the stimuluses, uh, apart from the assurance that there is an independent arbiter as a judiciary that should be available and enforcement of the court decisions, the system itself is conducive for investment, is stimulating and encouraging and attracting investment by being more attractive than other places which are all competing for investment around the globe. And, and then finally, it's the human resource, obviously, development. Ukraine is very rich in, in, in the areas of uh, uh, modern economy, so to say, in IT field, and not only with very skilled uh, uh, human resource. And apart from what already had been mentioned, upscaling and preparing the human resource for the modern economy fields, which uh, make it, makes it attractive for investment, is obviously very important as well. Thank you very much. I, I might get back uh, to this question when the Deputy Prime Minister rejoins us. Uh, perhaps you, uh, Mr. Adaminas, wants to react on that as well. Yeah, so again, sort of a couple of sentences. Uh, simply, of course, we, um, in order to maintain sort of uh, our in in investors' confidence, we need to, uh, Ukraine to uphold the respect for corporate governance and transparency. Uh, speed up uh, privatization, and, and but of course, um, security, external as well as internal, is, is, is a factor which, which builds confidence. So one of the topics we're going to discuss at the Ukraine Reform Conference, the, the security reform is, I think, a very important contributor, which uh, sort of very directly translates into, into uh, the investors' confidence. Um, and of course, we have to register sort of our concern over a recent event at uh, Ukraine State Oil and Gas Company, Neftegas. And uh, um, the suspension of the supervisory board uh, in order to dismiss the uh, management team. So, uh, and again, it's a register need for the respect for, for corporate governance and transparency there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just checking if the Vice Prime Minister is still with us, but I um, think she will return soon. So, uh, one other question I, I have here, and this is, you know, perhaps rather for the Europeans on, on the panel, but uh, so one part of is asking actually, are we as, as, as Europeans or as, as Western community or Euro Atlantic community actually doing enough to support uh, Ukraine? I mean, are there things that we could do more um, related to this? Perhaps is also there, you know, there, there are debates inside uh, the European Union about member states, what can be done, what cannot be done. So the question is just that perhaps are there perspectives uh, or areas where, where the West could still beef up a little bit of support uh, for Ukraine. Is this something I could ask to the Europeans on the panel? <laughs> I 
Minister, since this is uh, this is very much a member state question, uh, let me turn that over to you. Right. Well, um, well. First of all, I mean, sort of, you know, I, I want to, to, to repeat what uh, uh, the, the, the minister has said that uh, an, an important. Uh, uh, aspect of that is uh, uh, continuing with our commitment uh, to um, with with uh, Ukraine's internal integration, uh, gradual integration in in the EU internal market. Uh, and that's that's something that that would uh, contribute very directly. Um, and um, yes, and. Um, um, but, uh, and I, I think sort of it's, it's, it's quite important so that, once again, to reiterate that uh, our commitments, which are enshrined in the association agreement, are uh, uh, deepening sectoral cooperation. Uh, and um, so, so the, uh, that would be sort of probably my take on that. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, the question is not always what can we do more? The question is rather also what has already been achieved? Um, that's also an important one. Vice Prime Minister, you are back with us. Um, I think there was one question about uh, how to make sure that foreign investors feel confident to invest in Ukraine. Um, that was one question. Perhaps we can start uh, there. Uh, that's Thank you, Bruno. And so, sorry, I had to, to, to step out for for an important phone call. Um, but you know, this has been um, a very um, existential discussion, of not only like in Ukraine but everywhere. And I think there are like um, like uh, a number of answers. Of course, uh, things related to judiciary and credibility of the justice system uh, in a country. It should be the principal brand. Uh, which should uh, serve uh, to to attract investments and to make sure that uh, the reliable conditions are in our country. But I think what is more important is is uh, what not even more but equally important is the communication. You know, like we're here today uh, in the circle of the usual suspects, those who really follow Ukrainian topic and, and, and who really understand deeply what is happening in our country, both in a po positive and sometimes not very positive connotation. But uh, outside of this uh, bubble, let's say, there is so little of information of the situation, uh, of what is happening in Ukraine, what sort of existential transformations are happening when it comes to land reform, waterways, green transformations, decarbonization, many, many, many of the other things. It's just to name a few following up the, the recent discussions in Brussels. Uh, and I think that this communication and visibility of the, of the shifts and transformation in our country is really needed. So, and of course, Ukrainian reform conference uh, annual is, is, is the best platform for that, but we should do it on a daily basis and increasing this visibility is really important um, because sometimes, uh, you know, all the big companies and investors, they always mitigate risks. And of course, you can not be 100% sure that uh, some issues related to justice are addressed in a country, but sometimes those opportunities which are opened by the reforms we are paving the way towards, they um, prevail these risks and, and it uh, makes the big investors step in into our market. Just recently, I had a very good meeting with a French business in Ukraine. And the question was, how come that you prioritize the 40 million consumers market to enter in? And basically, none of these companies have ever felt sorry that they entered the Ukrainian market and they discovered the new geographical area. So, so I think that the communication visibility and, and uh, let's say promotion of the wide sides of, or, or, or the things happening in our country are equally important, but also it's about building the culture, the culture of being transparent, open, predictable. I think the predictability is something which is very much um, uh, not happening overnight. It's the long way of building trust and, and the lines and the links. And, you know, basically I felt a bit uh, envy uh, over my meetings in headquarters in NATO and EU. We had a lot of existential discussions and I understood that I'm really on, on a, the other side of the river 
because this uh, this integration allows to think strategically in 10, 15, 20 years perspective. But we always have only one political cycle so far, because every time in our country, we have this discussion, every elections are coming up with the discussion, East or West, this or that, what is better could be sold to the population. And this is something which lies in the heart of our aspirations. We want to be more strategic, we want to be more predictable, but we want to be more safe. So I would put these three components, the clarity of our Western, um, uh, Western path, the transparency and predictability through communication and promotion of our country, but of course, addressing and branding the rule of law reform in our country and uh, showing the commitment. Oh, thank you, Eka. I saw you raising your hands, but uh, I also want to uh, add a question to what you're about to react to. Uh, in the Q&A, uh, the minister mentioned the uh, usual suspects. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more about that because it's also about people in the end, right? Uh, so, Eka, one of the questions is also, so all this whole anti-corruption reforms, how do we also bring it to the people that it's not just something be dri being driven by the elites? Very, very good question. And it, it, it is actually linked to what I wanted to say to the, to the question as an added, uh, addition to, to answers to what more can we do when it comes to supporting the reforms. And it happens so that when you do a lot for the quick wins or strategic wins uh, in, in the process of reforms, it's very hard to look into the long-term perspective in terms of the generational changes as well. And then more often than not, youth is spoken about, but not is engaged as much as it should be in terms of either implementation processes or awareness campaigns and inclusiveness into the overall dynamics because time flies very quickly. What is, uh, what, what is the generation now at the high schools will be an electorate very soon. And then will be decisive uh, role play of what will be the future of the country. And one of the lessons learned in many countries that I could have in, I don't like this term, but I will use it for the sake of time, post-Soviet space is that to pay attention to education, to youth and new generation. And then as much as partners of Ukraine could have more educational programs, exchange programs, the, the better, better off uh, we all will be in the future. Because that what brings a mindset change, cultural change and expectation patterns in the societal clusters, so to say. And in that regard, uh, I would say that could be beneficial. And then how we bring society into it. First of all, it needs to be mentioned that Ukraine has very vibrant, strong civil society. It is not representative of the whole public, obviously. So while a lot is being done for maintaining um, potential capacity of the civil society to do its great work that they do, men and women that are engaged in this uh, very active uh, work of monitoring, putting the light on corruption that be or helping uh, reforms, it needs to be enlarged more, I would say, to the, uh, to the larger population. And in terms of explaining the links of what it means when we speak about reforms to their everyday life. So that it's not just conceptual things when we speak about integrity, values, corruption, but what it means if you are successful in this direction, how your life improves with that now, and even more so for your children in the future. And I firmly believe that that conversation, and I have these conversations with Ukrainians in different places, all resonate with that very well, because it takes patience from their side as well to be supportive of reforms and not to be disillusioned because reforms take time, they don't deliver right away. So I would think that engagement of the general public through civil society, which is trusted more at this stage rather than only government or internationals in this case, is, is a way forward in this regard and education and education as much as possible. May I come in with uh, one very quick comment? Uh, on what Eka just said. She mentioned reforms don't happen over, you know, overnight. And when you were asking before what, uh, Bruno, what we should be doing, I think we need to have strategic patience. I think we need to understand, and I don't think all of us do. And uh, it's hard to sometimes understand reforms if we haven't gone through them, um, that reforms indeed take time. And sometimes you only succeed in the next generation. And I very much agree with the idea of 
of uh, investing hugely in education. We are now increasing our budget on it. And one of the, one of the uh, I think, very good programs we've had is that 9,000 young people and teaching staff over the last few years benefited from the Erasmus Plus program. But this is still only a drop in the, in the sea. That's clearly not, uh, not enough, but that's certainly a direction to go. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Adonis, maybe you could give us a preview of the URC agenda in Vilnius. Are these issues that will be discussed uh, in July? I'm sure they will be. I'm sure they will be. But uh, I wanted also to, to add a couple of sentences to what Eka and, and uh, Katerina said. Um, and I, I think it's very important uh, how the public debate on reforms is framed in, in, in Ukraine. And our Lithuanian experience shows that, uh, well, not only that we need strategic pensions, but, but 31 years of independence has been a continuous reform process. And in fact, uh, if we uh, frame the reforms, issue of reforms as a certain corner, we have to go around and then that will be it, that will be finished. I think it's a mistake. I think in the, in the uh, 21st century, sort of globalized, rapidly developing world, reforms is a continuous sort of mode of being. And sort of, you know, once we finish one set of reforms, we have to, uh, there's a next sort of public sector which needs to be reformed. So actually society needs to accustom to the idea that reforms is, is a sort of modus vivendi, modus vivendi from now on. And what I think Echo was emphasizing, it's very important to find allies for the reforms. And that's why, sort of, you know, uh, in the public debate, uh, how it is framed and sort of reforms ought not to be represented as something technocratic. It's uh, it precisely determined in, in terms of public benefit and, and public good and to capture imagination. Reforms is not just a catching up process. You know, in, in sort of, you know, uh, sometimes we tend to present reforms. Okay, if you do reforms very well, you will catch up with us. You know, so the ones who are sort of been uh, long established and sort of on the path of uh, development and democracy and things like that. But uh, no, I think it's a chance to leapfrog, to go ahead, to get ahead of the game, to, dis uh, to develop and invent uh, new policies and uh, approaches which are sort of, you know, could be inspiration to, to other sort of older uh, democracies and the developers and, and I think Ukraine is already gone on, on, on this path. You know, the use of blockchain in, uh, that, that Decker has been describing is, is an example of that. So, uh, and this this idea that you know reform is a, a chance to to be ahead of the game is something that appeals very much to the young generation. And I think this is the natural ally for the reforms which we that we need to address. But yes, I think these ideas will be uh, cross cutting in, in, in our discussions in the in the in the conference in Vilnius. Great. Um, well, one viewer uh, comments that uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, reforms um, regarding to business, to education, to judicial, but how about the state institutions? Um, so the, the question is here that are the state institutions actually strong enough uh, to carry out the reforms that are now on the table? How about reforms in the public administration? Well, if I may pick that up uh, a little bit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, precisely one of the key areas that we have looked at and invested in. Uh, what we have done in the, in the, in the last three years is uh, we have invested about uh, 100 million euros in grants into, into uh, what we call results-based uh, financing, or sometimes it's referred to as budget support, although that's, that's not what it is, but to sort of incentivize really difficult steps and also provide technical assistance to professionalize the, 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 uh, civil, the civil service, both on the legislative side, but really very much on the capacity building. And one of, the, one of the efforts that we have been sponsoring and is still going on, and is really unique. This is the first time we have done it. Uh, and I think there are other countries looking at similar, uh, similar arrangements is uh, together with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, we have uh, set up a, a reform, Ukraine reform architecture as we call it, which is, which is embedding uh, reform teams of young Ukrainians into reform ministries, only those that are interested in not only the substantive reforms uh, that our specific ministry is carrying out, but also reforming the ministry itself. And the idea is that in this, in this interim period, 
before the 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 that reform undertakes because it also doesn't happen overnight. Uh, these reform teams um, uh, have a, uh, are very much helping in the delivery of the concrete reforms as well as uh, uh, reforming the ministries themselves and. Uh, some somewhere it's more successful, somewhere less. I mean, ultimately, again, it comes down to people and it comes down to leadership. But this is very much uh, an effort that is underway. And we are currently preparing a second generation of support of uh, public administration reform. Okay. Anyone else wants to comment on this? Yeah, if I may, just just to uh, add one thing, I think it's really important uh, to uh, pay attention on the resilience of institution. And of course, like uh, people, professional development and people capacity and professional skills is something which is really important and largely being considered and implemented together with the European Union as part of the first sectoral block of the reform of public administration, but building resilience of institutions and uh, is, is something really important. And we're uh, basically working on that just recently. The Commission for Euro Atlantic Integration has adopted the um, uh, concept for this national resilience, which will be hopefully endorsed by the presidential decree. And this is something that we were discussing. Uh, and again, it, uh, uh, it uh, is the whole set of issues, not only taking into account the human dimension, but the principles, the goals, and the um, national idea which should be interrupted in each and every inch of uh, of daily work and functioning of the public administration so I, I think that it would be good to to point out that and this could be the other way we are looking at the things back in key thank you very much Eka. Uh, um, I, I would want to add uh, a slightly from law enforcement side of it and then to say my uh, words of appreciation for anti-corruption bodies uh, it has been a different experience uh, with uh, new institutions that had to be uh, built from the scratch. And I think it, it, while it is not easy to say the least, it's easier when it comes to how one shapes up these institutions because you have the new people all screened, checked in terms of their own integrity and motivation. And those processes were very well devised how the personnel was um, accumulated, so to say, in those institutions. But it was very important from the very beginning how capacity development was in a targeted way provided to them with experience and with tools that they needed to develop these institutions. And I'm very proud that uh, we have been able to deliver that assistance to NABU, SAPO, to High Anti-Corruption Court. But the, the, but the praise goes to them because they are like everyday heroes. When you look to the way they work, it's an everyday commitment to a very difficult work that they do. And I want to say with, 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 with this sense of pride as well and satisfaction that when we have for European member countries, um, detectives, prosecutors, judges coming over, when they interact, they say one thing, and it's very common about, about all of these institutions, they are on equal terms with them because they are already developed in terms of their professionalism, uh, their skill sets in such a way that they can only grow, obviously, but they are already well-functioning professionals that have proven that even while facing attacks and while facing uh, the, the, the difficulties of the kind that was expected for them to have when they started to act, they persevered and they are an example of professionalism and dedication, which is already needs to be acknowledged because examples like that are already there in Ukraine. And I think they are the ones to learn from and then to, to see how that could be replicated perhaps in some other places as well. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, D dear colleagues, we're almost nearing the end of our time, but uh, perhaps as a um, finale, um, I'd like to ask you the following question. We, uh, uh, many of us will go to, to, to Vilnius in July. I, I do not know actually if the event will be hybrid. I, I believe it will uh, indeed. Um, so the question I, I have would be the following uh, to each of you. If, if you would like to see one result coming out of the Ukraine reform conference in July, what would it be? Let's perhaps start uh, with you, uh, Deputy Minister, Mr. Andominas. Uh, 
or someone else. <laughs> I would like to I would like to see the conference uh, contributing to dispelling some of the corrosive uh, disinformation narratives uh, about Ukraine. That's clear. Thank you very much. Eka. Uh, I would uh, echo what Katerina mentioned uh, by, by, by saying that dispelling the myth, bringing awareness uh, and attraction with that, that Ukraine is uh, one of the most dynamically developing countries right now in this part of the world. And it's all, uh, all the more important for those who are interested to support and be engaged and to invest, to pay attention to that. And by that, to, uh, to create another narrative, so to say, in terms of their understanding that Ukraine is part of Europe. And uh, by being in Ukraine, you are developing Europe and you are part of uh, Europe in terms of your own operation in the country. And for, for Ukrainian side, I would say that the takeaway, uh, what I would expect to have is that uh, support is unwavering, uh, that uh, Ukraine itself is ready as much as partners are ready to have honest conversation because that's what happens among partners, not just uh, neighbors or friends, but strategic partners. And the conference will gather strategic partners for Ukraine. So. Uh, uh, issues will be discussed honestly, openly, because the common strategic objective is the same. And I guess that perception would be important to have after the conference. Yes, and I guess uh, it would be good if I'll step in on that. Um, of course, my expectation is that uh, given the, the placement where the this year conference is taking place, it's really something which uh, um, is by its spirit and energy should be friendly, frank, and, and partner-oriented. Um, uh, but it's also part of the answer on the investment, but because business is really following this tradition, to, uh, and I think that would be good. But I think what is important that the, the spirit of this year would be the stepping up with the uh, for the new decade and what is expected and when, uh, where Ukraine sees itself. Uh, and um, how can we boost this physical, economical, and political suing of Ukraine with the with the democratic part of the, of the of the Europe, the European Union, and etc. I think that this is the, the discussion which is much more precise. Uh, most of the participants will have a lot of clarity and understanding what Ukraine is, where we are going through, and what we do we want to see. So I think that uh, the mm, best output of the conference would be something that we could not really discuss in the cabinets and the formal meetings or uh, even in informal meetings. But this is exactly the oldest uh, platform where we could uh, start and launch the discourses on each issues, which could then be transformed in policies and vision. So I, I hope that this would, uh, this uh, expectation would be materialized and uh, um, would contribute to that with, with the part uh, I'm in charge of, uh, in. Well, thank you very much. That was a very clear message. Um, I think it's fitting that we end with the host uh, of the Ukraine Reform Conference. So your perspective on this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, as you know, we are committed to supporting uh, Ukraine's um, uh, aspirations of uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. So what we want from this conference is very clear, very unwavering, uh, very sort of far-sighted uh, commitment to continuing reforms at a, at a brisk pace uh, in a very sort of uh, consistent and uh, yeah, uh, sort of res resolute manner. Uh, so help us to, to help you in a sense. Uh, we, we, we need this uh, message, we need this commitment to reforms uh, in order to, to, to support uh, your aspirations. And then this, I hope uh, this message, uh, a very unequivocal message that uh, Ukraine is making great progress, that it is committed, that it's uh, going to, to, to continue and uh, well to, surpasses all in, in its uh, sort of, you know, uh, through reforms and getting ahead of all of us, that, that would be a sort of, you know, a, a, a message that would uh, really make this uh, conference uh, memorable and, uh, and really worthwhile. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. Well, I'm afraid that uh, this is the end of our time. Uh, we like to be punctlich at the German Marshall Fund, so we'll have to uh, 
end up here, but uh, I do congratulate you on the ideas that you raised and the questions that were asked. Um, I know I learned a lot during the past 90 minutes. And uh, I also hope that uh, for you on the panel, on the panel, our speakers, that uh, you learn from each other, that uh, ideas were shared and uh, that we can all go to Vilnius uh, with a sense of mutual understanding and expectations. I hope that at least this event contributed a little bit to that. Um, I know that we at GMF will definitely continue to uh, address these issues and uh, work on Ukraine related issues, but also in Ukraine. So uh, I am confident that we will soon uh, see each other again uh, online, perhaps even in the near future for real, who knows, crossing fingers. Uh, but again, thank you to you on the panel. Uh, also, thank you uh, to our partners, to the Prime Minister uh, of Ukraine that already left as well, uh, and to the audience. Uh, thank you as well. So uh, with that, have a very nice day. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Bruno, for keeping this panel in order and in time. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Pleasure. Thank you Bruno, colleagues. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.